Hello and uh, welcome to the Bronx Latino Oral History Project. Uh, today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2022, and I am Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian for the Bronx County Historical Society. And I am joined today with, uh, by Dr. Payne, Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society and our subject, uh, Mr. Uh, Bob Atoni, uh, to conduct part two of his oral history. Um, Good morning, Baba Tony. Uh, welcome back. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see Dr. Payne. And um, my full name, Baba means father. And Antonio Mombesire Cabrera, Baba Tony is fine. It's good to be here. It's really good to be here. Today is the first day of the fall equinox, by the way. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So we're change of seasons. Very good point. <laughs> <laughs> out with the old and with the new <laughs> exactly. oh yeah we, we like new upgrade reboot refresh That's right. <laughs> great and you know be, before we begin i think it'd be fitting you know uh to give a little uh i guess a shout out uh to our you know puerto rican brethren on the island you know dealing with uh the aftermath of fiona um indeed so, yes you know with that said baba tony uh why don't you pick up where you left off uh, during part one with uh, your high school experience and anytime you're ready. Okay, great, great. And yes, thank you for edifying, edifying our connection to Puerto Rico, Borinquen, my maternal lineage of very loving, loving ancestry and my mom still living in Co-op City. And yeah, Co-op City. I went to Mount St. Michael Academy when we first moved to Co-op City in 1969. So I'm picking up right around the high school period. We moved from NYCHA housing, housing authority um, projects, that they call them projects in those days, That's Gun right. Hill Road and White Plains, Gun Hill Projects, Gun Hill Houses, the Co-op City, June of 1969. And I was going to junior high school, 113, Olinville Junior High School, 216 Street in the Bronx, in the Bronx Avenue. And um, most people went to, if they couldn't get into Bronx Science or Stuyvesant or Brooklyn Tech, which I missed, I missed by a couple of hairs. Um, the go-to was either Evander High School or Columbus High School. Evander High School on Gun Hill Road in Barnes Avenue had a reputation and um, of uh, the, the colorful behavior of, of uh, young adolescents in the urban area. <laughs> and for young men, some young men who'd like to express their testosterone, uh, there was always some drama after school at Evander High School, if you read between the lines. <laughs> and I was quite aware of that. And um, I remember my parents having a conversation with me, you know, Evander High School, and they rolled their eyes. I said, I know, Mom and Pop. They said, if you want to go to a Catholic high school, we're, we're open to financing that. I said, you know, let's look into that, Mom and Pop. They looked at Cardinal Hayes, they looked at Power Memorial in Manhattan and they looked at Mount St. Michael Academy. I think um, I visited all three. I said, Mount St. Michael Academy has a little campus in the northeastern part of the Bronx on the Mount Vernon border. It was almost like going to upstate New York in 1969 with real trees. They had a nice uh, football field and track. I said, I want to go there. High school, Roman Catholic high school, and run by the Maris brothers. I had to suit up every day. Tie, shirt, clean shaven, sports jacket. And matter of fact, the dean at the time, Dean Richard Cucario, would run a credit card across your face to see if you shave. Yeah. <sighs> But you know what? All that discipline for young men was almost like a uh, prolonged rite of passage. A prolonged rite of passage. And I liked it. Because young men need discipline. 
And there was the Maris brothers had like a tough love attitude. You know, like most were like came from working class Irish and Italian background. And most of the, the demographics of the school was children, young sons of Irish and Italian working class moving into the middle class. And then there were a few African-Americans and a few, few Latinos, which I was part of, right? And uh, young men with a lot of testosterone. But you know, the structure of the school allowed for that to be uh, channeled creatively, all right? Sports teams after, after, after school, I ran track. Uh, JV basketball, JV touch football. You let all that male energy out and it's not going to be destructive. Okay. And the Maris brothers, like I said, there were secular teachers, lay teachers, and there were uh, brothers which were like half priests. <laughs> <laughs> and they all had a, like a down to earthiness that I liked. There was a few brothers who wore the, the, um, outfits, the cloaks, something out of the Middle Ages. But most of the brothers wore lay clothing and were very approachable, including the lay teachers. So for that three years from 69 to 72, I have to say I, I liked a lot, okay? Um, I learned about the Roman Catholic history, which in that period I wasn't very happy with mm. and became increasingly disappointed with the Roman Catholic institution starting in, in, in the Vatican and then the history. But the teachings of the prophet Jesus, the Christo, the Christ, I like. Because as I was, even as a young fellow, I had an interfaith orientation. All right, I said, what do the Buddhists say? What are the... Um, I think we're momentarily locked up, Stephen. Yeah, I think he'll come back on here in a second. Still with us, Baba Tony? We'll give it another minute or two. Got it. He's probably rechecking the uh, video. Now, in terms of... Okay. Okay. Picking up where we left off. The Maris Brothers. Mostly working class Irish and Italian gentlemen, lay teachers and brothers in, 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 in civilian clothing. Some had the full middle age costume. Costume. <laughs> terrible, terrible. But at that age, I had an interfaith orientation. Okay? The foundation in Puerto Rican Espiritismo, where I saw my, at a young age, you know, relating to the Almighty through the um, uh, support of ancestral spiritual relations. And, um, of course, cognizant of African spirituality through Afro-Latino culture, Afro-Cuban music, especially, I had an open mind. Yeah. Ah, oh, grades kindergarten through nine, I had Ashkenazi Jewish American women, 80%, 90% of all my teachers in, in, in uh, public school were Ashkenazi Jewish American women. 80%, the other 20% were Italian-American women who grew up in the area. So here I was, and they you see, they didn't proselytize, and they weren't um, 
hardcore fundamentalist, but certain contradictions spoke to me very loudly, like the Vietnam War. And uh, young young people at the time uh, were looking at this like, well, how come the Roman Catholic Church doesn't take a strong position against the war and other social issues that uh, many in the Jewish community would take positions with or the um, African-American Protestant community took um, active roles in in, in participating in social change. The Roman Catholic Church was very quiet. So I said, hmm. So when I graduated, which I'm happy I did, and I, I still liked the school, I, I started exploring. Now, here's one experience I, 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 I'm very touched that I had there. A retreat in junior year. I didn't know what a retreat was, but as juniors, they took us to some um, location upstate New York, and for three days, we were like in in the country, and they let us do that. We had some freedoms, so they allowed us to smoke smoke cigarettes. So that was a big thing. Oh, you, you young guys could smoke cigarettes and drink coffee in the morning. And they made sure, no booze, no booze. Don't don't sneak uh, up here with pints of gin or vodka. Okay. And in that setting, there was also these classes of self-reflection. After the classes, go into the woods and write, write journal, breathe some fresh air and write or meditate or pray. And that was a great experience for me. Great experience it introduced me to this idea of retreating, retreating from the urban, yes, urban jungle. The Bronx was an urban jungle, maybe not as intense as Manhattan. And it that marked me that retreating, going into a quiet space for a couple of days to connect to the Almighty in whatever way was a value. So then post high school, I decided to go to a college, a university in Puerto Rico, because I was going through an identity process, affirming up my identity reference point. And my maternal lineage from Puerto Rico was the predominant cultural identity in my formative years. And I wanted to uh, improve my Spanish and have a sense of identity, because in the American amalgamation process, acculturation, assimilation, you just became either white or black. See? Is it that's not there's no culture to that. And okay, I resonated with the African American experience, but also the Jewish American and Italian American, and to some degree the Irish American. Okay. So I said, no, I want an identity reference that I'm comfortable with. And of course, as I've documented with um, these wonderful interviews, my formative years with Titi, Elena Lopez Cruz Antonetti, and Aunt Lily, Lillian Cruz, Lillian Lopez Cruz, they provided tremendous formative foundation building, along with my mother, Elba Cabrera. So it was Inter-American University, El Recinto de San Germán, the San Germán campus in the southwestern uh, region of Puerto Rico. And I uh, studied, I was enrolled in a liberal arts curriculum for two years there. Those four semesters marked me forever in a positive way. I was on my own. Uh, Two, year, two semesters on campus and two semesters I decided to move off campus to live in a, um, what's called a uh, urbanization, urbanization, hmm. right outside the, the school. And I wanted to rent my own room and ex- experiment with living on my own. 
um, off the campus. You know, I was going through my, uh, my process. Looking back, I wasn't the best cook, so I ate hamburgers and French fries for a whole semester. <laughs> no good, not good, not good. <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, I voluntarily took myself off of the cafeteria plan. Well, you got three square meals a day. Uh, the tuition it was part of the tuition, but I wanted this uh, independent process, and I learned from it. Never to do again. <laughs> but it was great experience. Nineteen seventy-four rolled around, and Puerto Rico and the campuses in Puerto Rico were going through uh, social social upgrade and the students on campus some students went on strike and pushed a strike process and unfortunately the very conservative conservative administration saw that as a a uh, an affront to authority and they called in what's called the fuerza de choque these are like National Guard um, and the Puerto Rican Police Department on steroids. Wow. And they came on campus and were very, very, very uh, violent in, uh, in, in, in dealing with these passive, pacifist students on strike. Okay. And there was like, there were uh, other dynamics that is very interesting to know for history. Some of the leaders in the student strike uh, protesting were part of FUPI, Feder uh, Federación Universitaria Pro Independente Independencia. Mm -hmm. So these were students who were pro-independence, who clearly leaned left of center. Usually the children of are, are solidly middle and upper middle class parents. Sure. They were the ones who were radicals but they got their heads beaten in and i saw that i said "Ooh, ooh!" a lot of us as new yorkans on campus many going through the same process i was going through uh reconnecting to their ancestry identity reference it was a great school because it was bilingual it was founded by um uh, either Methodists or Lutherans in 1904. Mm. A lot of us as New Yorkers were not involved in radical politics. It was like a gut feeling like, mm, don't get involved with that, man. We just want to get an education so we can move out of the projects where we go back to New York and move into the, the, the middle class. Uh, we may sympathize with some of the political um philosophy of the left and and independence of Puerto Rico but getting involved mm -mm. and we saw, I saw the uh, the aftermath so in corresponding with my my parents especially my mother she made the suggestion to to consider transferring back to New York and this is interesting because she said you may want to check out this school that I'm enrolled in that you yeah that's right SUNY oh. Old Westbury right <laughs> first New York College in Old Westbury and she promoted as, as very liberal very hip she was enrolled there I said wow what a what a um what a contrast to this conservative authoritarian um administration here and I checked it out and thought about it, thought about it some more. So, yep, I think I'm going to transfer to that school. I applied, I got in, and there I was, September 74, 1974, on the Westbury campus. My father and my brother drove me to the campus. And I was really clear on um, asserting my independence. <laughs> uh, so, in my, my father and my brother dropped me off. He said, okay, you can leave now. I'm on my own. 
Yeah, I was a little rough around the edges. Not my human relation skills were a little br brusque because I was really wanting to assert my independence. And there I was on the campus. Um, they called it uh, the urban campus village, something, uh, campus village. Um, concrete buildings all clustered together in the middle of the woods on the, um, the, uh, North side of the Long Island Expressway, exit 39 and 40. And for two and a half years, I was on that campus. And I was enrolled in what's called a interdiscipline curriculum called Politics, Economics, and Society with a undeclared but quasi minor in music. In music. Mm. And there I was, and my mother was a um, commuting student. She loved to tell this story, and I'll tell it too. I tried to avoid my mom when I passed her in the hallway. She told that story. <laughs> yeah, like, there's my mom. Oh, your your mom's on campus. What are your mama's boy? I, you know, I I had the perception on found the perception that that's how people would perceive me. So I kind of like played reserve and I walked by my mom and not really say hello. I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, mom, sorry. I, I, I was <laughs> 18, 19 years old. I wanted to exert my independence and I didn't want anybody to perceive that I was a mama's boy. See? Uh, I know she loves to tell that story and rib me. <laughs> <laughs> but that background, it wasn't disrespect. It was sure. me trying to show that I'm on my own. I'm not part of mommy's uh, plan here. Um, thank God I, I outgrew that. I was very proud when she graduated in 76. And I graduated in 77 with politics, economics, and society as my undergrad BA. Now, this is interesting. I had thoughts of going to law school. So what am I going to do with this interdiscipline undergrad? Where most of my professors in that curriculum were Marxist left of center professors who were very good at theory, but to apply Marxist politics in real life in 1976, 1977, I always had an issue with that. How are you going to go back to the community, to the Bronx, and start speaking scientific socialism and Marxism and dialectic materialism? No, people are trying to survive and thrive, fighting their way into the middle class. So I had a little philosophical um, dissonance with my left of center professors, although I, I resonated with the philosophy, I knew that I was. this was just a, a passing phase in my life. I knew it. Because they weren't spiritual, and the foundation of me was spiritual. I said, I bet you even Marx was spiritual, because his father was a rabbi. But this level of political philosophy, um, as much as I've seen over the decades, uh, really meets a lot of pushback in the society we lived in. Okay? So that was the story. So here I was, 1977, and here's where things changed for in a very interesting way. I started studying Bata, Afro-Cuban Bata, religious drumming with a gentleman I met in Central Park. That gentleman met me at a rumbong session, mm. playing congas. Now, here's the story. I arrived from Co-op City to Central Park. No helmet, gym shorts. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Co-op City to Central Park on a summer day. And my goal was to go by the rumbero section by the fountain or the lake and play congas, okay? 
But as on my way on, on the road, the, the Western road, uh, traveling towards the 77, 72nd Street Traverse Road, I see some drummers. And they're playing a 6-8 rhythm. And I look closely and say, these look like uh, white guys, man. Maybe a little on the hippie side, bohemian side. And they're playing drums. And it sounds good. <laughs> Who are these guys? So I almost screeched to the halt, screeched to a halt. And these guys are playing, and they're, they're really playing well, six, eight. And um, I stood there almost baffled, like, wow, maybe I could sit in with these guys. And two of the drums were like handcrafted drums, painted nice, sculpted with like African motifs. I found out later, West African, specifically Yoruba motifs. And there was a gentleman there who I've seen before. I found out later, his name was Morty Sanders. I saw him, I've seen him before at the Rumbons. Like a muscular um, gentleman who looked like he was a tough sailor in his younger days. He was like in his 50s at the time, smoking a big cigar with muscles and a T-shirt and the sacred beads of the Lukumi, quote-unquote, Santeria tradition with a big bushy mustache. I said, what a character this guy is. Who is he? Right? Wow, look like Popeye the Sailor Man with a big cigar. So he was one of the personalities there. And the other gentlemen were playing. And when they finished one session, I asked to sit in. And they gave me the New York up and down look like, who are you? And they said, okay, let them sit in. I sat in. And the gentleman who later... I would be studying with John Amira. So what do you want? What do you want us to play is the, um, the bottom straight rhythms? Because they were testing me. They put me on the drum where you can actually improvise. Called the quinto. Could you play an abacua? No, abacua. Abacua is the rhythm of the calabar male society in Cuba called Abacua, uh, called Abacua from the Calabar region of what's called Nigeria, Cross River. And they had a fraternal order called the Abacua where their music influenced a lot of the Afro-Cuban and then later salsa of the day. Very powerful music. And the rhythms are very, very powerful polyrhythmic, very syncopated. So you really had to be a student to play those rhythms. So when I said play in Abacua, he looked at me like, hmm, you're not the average rumbero here. They gave me the down, the, 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 the basic beat, beats on two or three drums. And I improvised on the quinto very, very well as per tradition. When that session was over, those guys looked at me like, ah, oh, you cut the mustard. And Morty, the gentleman looked like Popeye with the bushy mustache, the big cigar. Let me shut that off. Bear with me here. This is uh, okay. Take your time. Anonymous. Let me move it to another room. He says to me in New York lingo, holy bleep, what rock did you crawl out from under? <laughs> you played a blank out of that drum, man. Give me five. <laughs> <laughs> and this crusty Brooklyn Jewish accent like he was a truck driver or a deli manager all his life in a tough neighborhood. And that was very appealing to me. And I said, I'm in. 
I don't know these guys yet, but I cut the mustard with these guys. Right? <laughs> well, long story short, so John Amira invites me to become part of a drum ensemble. He was forming a, a, a reboot of the, the religious drums of, of, of Cuba called Bata, based on the Yoruba Lukumi tradition. And to play those drums required a lot of discipline, talent, and it was kind of coveted because the Afro-Cuban elders did not teach those drums, teach those rhythms. So to learn those drums, I found out John Amir and some other gentlemen studied from the records. Mm. And that's phenomenal. Because you have drums that sit on your lap and there's two heads. So this six head, a three man team would play six drum heads, very syncopated rhythms. So to learn that from records, hi-fi records, vinyl, 33 RPM, is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. So he was doing a, 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 a an up update to his drum ensemble. He invited me to 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 study with him, and I did. I started studying with him. Phenomenal, a technician. During that period. I graduated from college and I'm like, okay, am I going to go to law school or at my summer job with UPP with DT, summer lunch program. But John started to get to know me and he found out like most people do that I have a, a fascination with New York City subway system. They said, wow, you really know about the, the subway system. I can't stand it, but you know a lot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> he was going out with a young lady, Jamaican young lady, who had a class in urban planning, blah, blah, blah. She had to do, she elected to do a research project on the New York City Transit Authority, New York City Transit System, the subways. And she was panicking. Because it was due like in a week and she didn't do anything. So John calls me. You think you can help my girlfriend out? She'll buy you a whole pizza pie and a liter of Pepsi Cola. She <clears throat> won't pay you, but she'll put her cassette recorder on. And I said, sure. Pizza pie, 18 years, 19 years old, 20. I could devour one in, in one city. And I could talk about subways all day. She recorded me an hour and a half. Remember the 90 minute cassettes? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She recorded me, fed me the pizza, the Pepsi Cola. A week later, got an A plus on the term paper. <laughs> and the professor said, boy, your source is pretty good. I know you didn't plagiarize this. You gave the gentleman credit, but let him know he knows his stuff. So John worked at the uh, New York City Department of Planning at the time. And he says, you know, they got a transportation planning department here at city planning at um, uh, 2 Lafayette Street. You should come down and talk to this person here, Marty Huss. Who knows? Yeah. Thank you, John. I go meet the gentleman. He says, boy. You, you know you know you know your stuff and um, that's great. We don't have openings here, but you should check out the Polytechnic University, Polytechnic at Brooklyn Polytechnic on J Street in Myrtle Avenue. They have a graduate program in transportation planning and engineering. Then with a twinkle in his eye, he was a uh, Ashkenazi Jewish American from Brooklyn. And had, was very down to earth and had some grit. He said, between you and I, they have an affirmative action quota they got to meet. And you just might be the kind of person they want to talk to. Wink. 
So, yeah, I know what the game is, quotas. I go the next day and I meet a uh, professor who's kind of like the go-to, look me up and down with condescending eyes. They're like, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Come here in 70 to, 48 to 72 hours with three letters of reference from very important elected officials and corporate presidents in the whole nine, and maybe we'll consider you, right? With a real condescending, aloof attitude. Well, I get, I got to work. Guess who I called? It wasn't Ghostbusters. I called Titi, right? Of course. Of course, my Titi, Evelina Lopez Cruz Antonetti. Titi, do you think, blah, 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 blah. Mm, let me make some phone calls. Well, a little while later, I said, okay, call, I think it was Herman Barrio, the Bronx Borough President, the former Bronx Borough President, and call um, Father Fitzpatrick at Fordham University and call this other politician this other politician and go meet them and go pick up your letter on their stationery. Huh? That's how much pull Titi had. Wow. Yeah. And I did that. And I got all the letters on nice, what's the nice parchment paper? The nice paper, not the plain paper, a nice paper on the nice letterhead, the nice letter. They crafted the letter. I didn't have to provide the content. They crafted the letter. And instead of three, I had four letters. And I, I, wrote, I went back to the school, presented all those letters to this snotty professor. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and both eyebrows went, <laughs> 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 All right, well, maybe we'll consider you. Now, you know, get out of here. I have another student. I went home to Co-op City, number five train from Borough Hall in Brooklyn to Baychester Avenue, contemplating, wow, this is a civil engineering grad course. 36 credits in and um, subjects I kind of avoided most of my life, heavy math and engineering oriented. I didn't see myself as an engineer, although I actually am, because more of the social sciences were promoted to me in my educational foundation. Even though my father was an electronic technician and he was basically an engineer, that side of the academic cultivation in my progress wasn't emphasized. In retrospect, with my fascination with the urban rail system and uh, with, a, with, a, with an acumen for gory detail, tracks and rolling stock and, yeah, I'm an engineer at heart. I said, I contemplated like, wow, this is a civil engineering undergrad. Well, let's see what happens. Well, I think 24 to 48 hours later, I was accepted. I was accepted in August wow. of 1977. So in September 77, I'm enrolled in Brooklyn Polytechnic or Polytechnic University of New York in the transportation planning and engineering curriculum department. Started my whole journey there. So how am I with time? Am I talking too much on question one? Because we got a four more questions. <laughs> how are we doing? <laughs> oh, we're, we're great. This is this is great so far, Baba Tony. Okay. Uh, whenever you'd like, we'd, uh, you know, and you get a moment, we'd love to hear about your experiences uh, with your uh, spiritual journey how that began for you. Okay, let me segue into spiritual journey from one experience I had in that first semester. Actually, I linked 
to spirituality. And well, how do you do that? How do you link engineering and secular academia with spirituality? Here's how I did it. I had a class in master, master planning for airports. Master planning for airports. I said, wow, it was, it was a required course. And I take the course, and here I am. I'm used to, like, I can talk about subway trains, rolling stock, tracks, tunnels, elevated structures, and New York has this, and London has that, and Paris has this. But this class was an eye-opener. I was like, whoa, how do you plan an airport? It takes years to plan an airport. They take wind analysis in a geographic area that it took uh, a lot of evaluation to select. And they build up a database of one to two years of how the wind blows. Literally how wind patterns. Why? So they know how to set up the runways. You have runways, alternative runways for landing and taking off based on the way the wind blows. And then you have this environmental impact statements to write because of the residential areas near the airports. If the residential areas was of, of, of a particular demographic, you could not fly over those areas. If it was another demographic, you can clearly fly landing planes over this, those areas. See? Yeah. We follow that bouncing balls. We think of LaGuardia Airport and the Elmhurst residential community where you could look up and almost see the, the pilots in the, in the plane. Just think of how loud that is. Yeah. And 101 other variables in planning an airport. This was like visionary planning. Holistic, because it was regional, not just by borough. They talked about JFK as a regional airport for the tri-state region, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Newark was a little bitty airport at the time. JFK was rated international. And, of course, IFR, the, the uh, computerized um, radar systems, were the newest technology that would allow pilots to land planes in fog or bad weather based on coordinates, XY coordinates on their screens. I found that absolutely fascinating. And it opened my, my eyes and head and consciousness to larger thinking. And I clearly related that to spirituality or batala the master plan of human society, not on the, not just the granular level, but on a regional level. And all the interrelationships between the economy and uh, terrestrial infrastructure and ground access from the central business district and airlines and the FAA and military standards. I said, wow. This is more holistic than the, the train buff little boy in me. Mm -hmm. And now, now we segue to the spirituality because I started to see from my academic experience that one, to grow, you have to look at the world from a larger perspective, not just this local Bronx housing project uh, subway train ride from Brooklyn to the Bronx. No, there's a larger expanse of life to be researched and appreciated. And um, maybe we'll put a pause button on that and you could ask some questions related to question two or three and I could work off that. How's that sound? Sounds good. Dr. Payne, did you want to jump in with any direct questions? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, 
you know, you, you brought up in the first part of your oral history and, and again, um, earlier today, the kind of interconnectedness between. Uh, Hello. Okay. We're there, right? Oh yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. I think a little, uh, I tapped the wrong button and something happened. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so okay. I, let I me was, get, uh, uh, let me get audio back. Cause the audio is very low. You could hear me and I hear you very low. Okay, okay. So can we can you put it on pause for a second? So I can sure, sure, it sure. Let's put let's pause That's it. Good. Yes, Baba Tony. Uh yes. You know, listening to to your experiences transitioning from high school uh to those four semesters that you spent at La Universidad de Puerto Rico in San Germán. Did I get that correct? Yeah, uh UP no, no, I'm sorry. At the Inter American University of Puerto Rico, San Germán campus. All right, thank you. I sure. was really wondering, as a New Yorican, right, what were your experiences like in Puerto Rico? How were you expected? Those, uh, you know, those those issues that we deal as, uh, you know, part of the diaspora returning uh, home, so to speak. Excellent question. Wonderful question. First, 1972. August. New York is a pejorative. Okay, now that term was coined because a a a, 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 a New York poet gave a seminar on that campus the year earlier. I think it was Jose Angel Figueroa, if I'm not mistaken, and he, he brought the genre of New York poetry of which he composed and also wonderful artists like Pedro Pietri and Tato Laviera and uh, maybe Papoletto. And we're introducing this genre to the, the, on campus. And I was like, people are like, huh? Cause the, our genre of New York and poetry, you pull from the urban experience, which tends to be on the rough side working class neighborhoods, interactions with African-Americans, and many of us, we actually acculturate with African-American urban nuances. At the time, if you had long hair and it was curly, you had a fro, or you had longer hair and facial hair. So there was this archetype of the New York male being on the radical side, left of center, or unfortunately, the uh, titanes, the the uh, <laughs> the rough the rough guys from the projects were, were maybe uh, a little ornery involved in criminal activity. There were stereotypes, maybe maybe a few created those stereotypes, but it was enough to make people consider the New Yorican from New York City uh, an unwelcome persona. The young ladies were considered fast and loose because they didn't dress using the conservative dre dress style of the island. They might, wore, they might have wore uh, hot pants or short shorts or tight jeans and had more of a liberal attitude towards their um, behavior and femininity. So there was this pejorative stereotype of the New York Rican. Now, that was very interesting, where the New York Rican persona on the male side was very much um, uh, accepted were recruits to, to the basketball teams. So <laughs> New York Rican males from New York City, especially housing projects in Manhattan and Brooklyn, Johnson projects, Jefferson projects from the Barrio, a handful of them were recruited by the San Gilman basketball team. And these brothers, growing up, growing up with African-Americans, themselves mulatto of color, came down with froze and New York swag and all of that, and they played good basketball. So they further 
fed into this stereotype of the New Yorican. And I fit into that stereotype. Mulatto male, uh, muscular, fro, with that little um, urban swag when I walked. Because that's part of the experience here, see? And um, I was met with some interesting dynamics. And pushing the envelope, other uh, second generation Puerto Ricans who are not from New York, but like my friend Tuti Arturo Salas from Buffalo, well, they put all um, uh, stateside, stateside born second generation Puerto Ricans as New York Ricans. Some came from Cleveland or Los Angeles. Some were raised on military bases, more like military brats, raised in Panama and Germany, but they all got this, this umbrella term as New Yorican. And part of the dynamic was a, a combination of attraction and awe and jealousy, because we were all almost fully bilingual. And some of us really, like myself, especially and others, pushing the bicultural envelope to water down our exclusive North American, Americanized culture and really embrace, in my case it was definite, to embrace the local culture and for me it was via the music. So they found out right away I played congas and bongo. And some of the local musicians on campus and off campus would call me to do gigs. They wanted a conguero. So when I cut the mustard as a, I could play, they said, oh. I got the nickname as Tony Conga. Oh, wow. Tony Conga. And that helped me with my Spanish and overcoming this, you know, a North American Anglo, uh, Anglicized. Anglophonic uh, dynamic that I you you develop you develop being born and raised in New York and I became a little popular and by the way <laughs> I played not not for money I played I never forget a fraternity on campus asked me to play for one of their fraternity festivals. We can't pay you, but we can feed you and you can drink all the beer you want. <laughs> <laughs> they put me on the back of a truck and we played salsa and comparsa very lively for eight hours in the sun. Wow. They didn't pay me a dime, but they fed me and they, they, they fed, they, I drank the beer and it passed right through me. And I developed this reputation, like, wow, he's really a good percussion, a good conguero, he plays bongo, he can sing a little bit. You know, that day, the, for the first time ever, when I urinated, what came out of me was, was blood. Mm. Yeah, I, I played so much that I broke down blood vessels in my hands and my body went through a conniption. I found out that, yes, yeah, sometimes musicians, especially percussionists, if they don't drink enough water, they could actually start to urinate blood. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't blood, it was urine, the, the color of like beet juice or, or maroon. That didn't faze me. And um, that contributed to a little bit of popularity on, on the campus. And I was able to water down the New Yorican stereotype because I really wanted to relate to the culture of the island. And the music was the um, open road to that. Because I started to really appreciate, appreciate more also La Musica Jibara, which wasn't heavy percussive, but string, the El Cuatro. And the, 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 the musical form that I later learned came from Southern Spain via North Africa. 
when I identified that North Africa, Spain, Moorish, Moorish culture in Spain for 700 years, and Sephardim, Ladino Jewish culture. So all of that Lelolai has those elements. Ooh, I ate that up, man. Yeah. I ate that up. So that pushed me. If I, in retrospect, I developed a strong passion for anthropology. Like, where, where do we come from? What's our roots? We do have African roots. That was not promoted back then. It was peripheral. And it was the Afro-Cuban model of salsa where people plugged into a, a appreciating an African connection. The African indigenous connection from the island was not promoted like the Afro-Cuban. So Bomba and Plena were still at that time marginal, marginal. Only the very progressive folks would play Plena, but Bomba wasn't the movement yet. And that was very, um, very enlightening for me. Because I, I did move around the island. And I remember in 1973, based on one class in anthropology, um, the teacher, professor, an Anglo woman was, boy, she was so loving of Puerto Rican culture. She said, you know, you may want to attend UPR for the 100th anniversary of the uh, 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 abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico. 1873, slavery was abolished in Puerto Rico. In 1973, UPR had a conference on this. When I went there and got the feeling of serious research at, into the African contributions to Puerto Rican culture, Actually, the horrors of slavery and what the Spaniards did to circumvent a revolution like what took place in Haiti, circumvent what took place in Cuba at the Grito de Yara. There was Grito de y uh, Lares in Puerto Rico, but there was Grito de Yara in Cuba. And much of the uh, catalysts were Afro-Cubans. So I was learning all these nuances of history based on descendants of Africans and the Spanish-speaking societies, including Colombia and the Dominican Republic, they said, wow, this is rich. So my two years there were very, 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 very uh, enlightening. And I was clearly, in my mind, trans- um, transcending the New Yorican stereotype. See? Where, by the way, almost 30 years later with the reggaeton movement, the New Yorican stereotype was embraced by most of the young people because of the roots of reggaeton with a little rap with Jamaican um, uh, Jamaican house was a Jamaican dance hall um, uh, the urban environment that reggaeton really cultivated near the, the caserios, the housing projects in the San Juan metropolitan area, and returning Boricuas, Puerto Ricans, to the island with, with uh, uh, urban swag. Let me put it that way. And we learned that this urban swag, much of it inspired by African-American males, was becoming globalized, where German young people in Germany or German uh, working class areas or Japanese working class areas in Tokyo were adopting this same urban swag from the hip hop movement and so on, and so on, so on, so on. So <clears throat> the New Yorican archetype was becoming mainstream on the island in, in the 2000s. So uh, I hope that answered some of your question, Pastor. Pastor, it, it does. This. That was an awesome, awesome narration of your experiences during those years. Uh, Thank before you. I, before I let you go on that topic.
topic, if you would, and we move on to the United Bronx, you know, uh, parents and your experiences there. Can you touch really on how your uh, your diet and your your taste for New Yorkian food and Puerto Rican food may have uh, either clashed or, uh, you know, improved or opened you up to uh, new recipes being from New York? My dietary um, uh, proclivity started transforming. And when on occasion, I would go, no, here, here's the story. My tia, my grandmother's elder sister, was my matriarchal uh, go-to on the island. So on the weekends, I'd go from San Germán to Rio Piedras to where she lived in an urbanization called Summit Hills, uh, near Avenida Central and Avenida San Patricio, near the Guaynabo border. And on the weekends, I'd go to Tia's house, take a, a, a public car, carro público, for 10 to $15. It's was crazy how cheap it was to travel. And on occasion, she would cook yuca and yautia, Besides the, you know, the rice and beans, the arroz con pollo. And I wasn't raised with yuca or yautia or ñame. Okay, I would have tostones, mom would make platanos or uh, platano maduro sometimes, blah, blah, piñon. But man, ñame, yuca, yautia, I like this. And of course, when she made it with bacalao, mm. I remember at 18, 19 years old, I started like, whoa. And inside me, it was like, this is our soul food, man. I could eat this every day. With aguacate on the side, avocado, ensalada de aguacate, bacalao, yuca, ñame, yautia with good olive oil poured on it and garlic. Oh, man. I have that garlic. <laughs> The olive oil with uh, vinagre, salt, pepper, and whole garlic, crushed garlic cloves in a pilon, right? So you have like a mojo on top of the beyond, we call that beyond the tubers, yuca, ñame, or yautia, right? Forget about it. I was hooked. And my taste started changing. I said, this is, and it was, it's, 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 it's ancestral. It was clearly ancestral because that's what our African descendant and our indigenous Taino descendants, the, the tubers from their culture, our culture, and the tubers from African culture, the, especially the, the yam. The yuca was uh, indigenous to the Caribbean and South America, cassava, yuca, but the yame was imported. And yautia, which they call red cork on the other islands. I'm not sure where that's from. Mm. But man, oh, sometimes cornmeal, funche con bacalao. Okay, so you have like a, a like a uh, cornmeal mush cut into cubes. What's the Italian name for uh, cornmeal? Oh, uh, um, polenta. Po polenta, right. So funche and bacalao, another go-to. And then I, when I resonated that this was the, the people's food, this was not the elitist food. These were like our ancestors who were salt of the earth, who either chopped sugar cane or cultivated coffee or uh, grew tobacco, salt of the earth, either Hiwaro or fisher, fishermen on the coast. I resonated with that. So my diet was clearly changing in my taste. And of course, I must have, I have to edify Thea's husband, my grand uncle, who I called Papi, Don Enrique Godro Hernandez, uh, Vasquez. Mm -hmm. We call him Don Godro. He took a lot of pride in making mofongo. And from the Summit Hills Urbanization House, he would walk towards Bayamon on the military road, road number two. And in those days, 
the little vendors had these little push carts painted in bright colors with whole port pork skins, chicharron, the whole side of a pig, <laughs> fried, fried pork skin, a whole slab. He'd buy that, come back, and create mofongo al pilon mm. with the cracklings of the pork skin and the crushed platanos and the garlic and the salt and the pepper and the whole nine. And he made this like sauce, like soup to pour it over it. Forget about it, man. <laughs> you could have McDonald's and Burger King anytime. I had mofongo. That was it. And I would wash it down with Malta, cold Malta. Mm -hmm. Malta India, Malta Corona, Malta Hakway, which is basically unfermented beer, very sweet. And I was good to go. I that 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 hooked me to what I consider like typical Puerto Rican cuisine, which it was an evolving process on my part also. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, it's getting close to lunch and, you know, uh, that was <laughs> getting me very hungry. Uh, <laughs> me too. So I was holding out, you know, kind of like doing this, but uh, that was awesome. Um, Thank you. You know, would you, uh, be, before we move on to United Bronx, Bronx parents, uh, mm -hmm. do you have anything you want to cover before we move on? Well, um, no, except the importance of this oral history. This is not scripted, this is my life. And I, I obviously you see I'm, I'm enjoying this because I like people of all stripes and ethnicities and so forth to find something they can relate to in my story. Because it's a human story. It's a story that um, I think has a universality to it. And I enjoy this process, enjoying sharing, because we all, we're all going to benefit from our stories told. And the Bronx is a very special place. So I just want to edify Dr. Payne and yourself, uh, Doctor in Progress, Pastor, right? Crespo. Thank you for the opportunity to share these stories, because this is real life. And I, I hope it's inspiring and uplifting to uplifting to everybody who's going to experience uh, this little video clip. Yeah, and you know, we, we definitely want to thank you for sharing those, uh, you know, private moments of your life that are really, uh, you know, hard to share. And uh, you know, we we thank you for that. Uh, it, it means a lot to this project. You know, so. You. Uh, you <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I I really wanna incorporate in this your experiences with uh, both your titis, Elena and Lillian, you know, and your work, uh, you know, apparently you spent a lot of summers there uh, at United Bronx Parents, uh, and you work with the community experiences there, if you would love to share some of that. Oh, absolutely. I was reflecting on this yesterday, and well, the last couple of months. Titi, Elena Lopez Cruz Antonetti, by the way, notice I use her Okay, say maiden name, but Lopez was his paternal name and Cruz was her maternal name. And then he married Donato Antonetti, who's actually a distant relative. Mm. A distant okay. relative. Okay, and that's that's for the record. So Antonetti's Antonetti's in and our maternal maternal lineage, beginning with uh, Mama Mangala. Antonetti, our, my great, 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 great grandmother. Titi's contribution to the human society was only about 19 years at UBP, creating the organization in 1965. And she left our mother earth surface prematurely in 1984. 19 years. But those 19 years, what she did was phenomenal. And I've been reflecting on this, especially reading the excellent biography that Wally Edgecombe wrote about. And all she did, what she represents, she was a 
a loving matriarchal archetype that Jung would edify. Carl Jung, who I think coined the term archetype, that every society has a human personality that's arch archetypical, that you'll find in every human society. Well, Titi was an archetype, a loving, but tough as nails, matriarchal archetype, and UBP was an institution that reflected that exactly. A loving matriarchal archetype of a institution, United Bronx Parents, where she had two Ashkenazi Jewish women full of love, tough love, strong sense of social justice and education on both sides of her, Ellen Laurie and Kathy Golden. And they created this organization to do just that, to be united, Bronx, and then parents that need to be empowered to be critical thinkers of the horrible education that was being administered to our, our, chi our children, see? So that was, that philosophy, I was like introduced to as I saw the embryonic formation of UBP on his first office, I think 608 Union Avenue. And my mother became the secretary and I would go there during the summers with mom and play on the streets. And I always found, well, Gun Hook Projects was not considered the ghetto back then. But you go south of the Cross Bronx Expressway, all of a sudden, the way New Yorkers judge neighborhoods, it was becoming the ghetto. Right? So Union Avenue, that was Tini's building, Doña Carmen Munoz, who was Titi, one of Titi's best friends. And she let her building be the home office of this embryonic UBP. And I wasn't quite getting it then. I was, what, 10 years old. But it was seeping into osmosis. Okay? And then later on, the move to Prospect Avenue, that's when it really started kicking in what's really going on here, because I was also entering my puberty years. And I was going to Olinville Junior High School, and I saw there's like apartheid going on in the junior high school. Grammar school at PS41 on Olinville Avenue was one thing, but Olinville Junior High School was another animal. And we were, I was being introduced to the, <laughs> the contradictions of American society right away. And by the way, we were in the Vietnam era. Martin Luther King um, was very vocal in articulating the contradictions of uh, American society, I was becoming politically and socially very conscious. So here's Titi's organization really starting to influence me. And then it started getting more interesting because Titi saw the, um, the uh, relevance of cultural education now, this occurred after I got my summer job as a neighborhood youth corps worker. You know, I, I got you know, I, I got in because Titi was the big, bigger boss, Miss A, and my mother was the executive secretary, so I was able to get neighborhood youth corps jobs. Now, that wasn't cushy jobs. We had to clean up vacant lots and talk about humble. You know, you clean up dead rats and garbage in your Converse sneakers and uh, Lee dungarees. You get a perspective like, why all these vacant lots? Why all the garbage? Why? You know, what's going on here? Well, I got my uh, my my nice little check that uh, Titi Stella, Stella Rodriguez, who was Titi's chief financial officer, she gave me the check. And there was my little money there. And I have my pocket money, and I saved up for my first conga drum and all that good stuff, right? But then, you know, I think it was the summer of 68, Titi had these little classes on culture. 
And for the first time I heard of Taino. Taino, what's a Taino? And most of us, what's a Taino? Those are our indigenous ancestors. Indigenous, what's indigenous? We're first, second, third, fourth cousins to the indigenous people, the Native Americans here, American Indians in the United States. Really? That's a Taino? That's an Arawak? Yeah, and there were societies and there were leaderships called leaders called caciques and on and on and on. She brought a gentleman named Hector Guzman from Utuado, Puerto Rico. And he gave a, a whole class a lecture on Nuestro Tainos. Because that he that was his passion, and he was researching how much of our indigenous culture is still intact, and it's in our blood, and it's in our language, it's in our food, it's in our philosophy, and like, what? That was all Titi's doing. And she created the Ura Yoan University. Ura Yoan, who's that? Oh, that was a cacique who wanted to test these Spaniards. Are these Spaniards gods? Mm, they ride on these horses with these metallic uh, uniforms. Are they gods? Let's test one out. Or well, he tested one out by putting, putting the, capturing the guy, putting his head on the water, and he died. <laughs> oh, so they're human beings, huh? So we don't have to bow to them because they're killing our people. They're taking our land. Da, 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 da. Ura Yoan. Okay, warrior a chief, a visionary. She named a little university, Ura Yuan University. Mm. And we learned so many other things about our indigenous relations. Then it went a step further. Aunt Lily, Lillian Lopez Cruz, my other titi, brought this film to the library I think the library was um, on 138th Street in Alexander Avenue called Nenen de la Ruta Mora about Luis Aldea in Puerto Rico. The premier town where African culture is intact. Other towns have African descendants and more of an afro Boricua feel, but Luisa is at the top. And aldea means village. So she brought this film and it, it showed the town and also the festival, the Bejigantes festival, mm -hmm. celebrated during the Santiago, celebration of Santiago Apostal in June or July. And we saw this film and we saw Puerto Ricans clearly of Central and African ancestry. And to a lot of people, this was like a mind blower. That can't be Puerto Rico. Look at all those black people. No, that's Puerto Rico. Those are our people. They live there right now. And the conditions were a little bit less urban, very village-like, um, almost from another century. But it was so rich culturally and we saw the Vejigante Mass, the bomba being played in a raw form, not the jazzed up form that uh, Rafael Cortijo made popular in the late 50s, early 60s. Which, by the way, his source was, the, was Don Rafael Cepeda, who sang in that raw form. I love the raw form. So we were exposed to that, and Titi made it very clear. Yeah. We have African descent, and we have our own um, Afri African-inspired culture. This was right around the period that James Brown came out with that um, track, I'm Black and I'm Proud, in 1967. Mm. And I was right in the mix. And in the Williamsbridge section of the Bronx, with a lot of African-American, especially males, now would call themselves black. 
where months earlier, if you called any person of Africa that said black, you got into a fight. Black was a pejorative, but James Brown made this proud, made people proud. So I, I was kind of vibing with that. But in me, I said, well, I'm not African, North American. We have our own connection to Africa via our Afro-Cuban beloved music, which we appropriated as our own because it's an extension, Cuba y Puerto Rico. Son uh, dos alas del mismo pájaro, two wings of the same bird. So a lot of us embraced Afro-Cuban music and culture as our own. But then this Bomba and Plena and Loisa, wait a minute, we got our own African thing going on here. It's another flavor of blackness, so to speak. And Titi made that very clear, very clear. So UBP in those days became really consciousness raising for me with, in terms of identity. And let's face it, we all have to have an identity or else the, the North American matrix puts you into a ethnic white, not quite white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but ethnic white or black category. No culture, just color. See, and the cultural richness that I was being educated in was resonating with me on an ancestral and DNA level. So UBP became more than just parental education. It became um, consciousness raising for me. And it started to really reinforce the four formative years that Titi and Italy participated in in my earlier days. I hope that helps. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. That, that was, uh, it was so enlightening. Uh, you know, just want to take this time and thank you. You know, for Oh, of course. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Payne? Yeah, yeah I, I, I have uh, one follow-up question for now on UBP and yes. Wilson and Evelina. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the some of the potential individuals or other kinds of sources that were informing Lillian and Evelina? Because um, you know, at 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 the time, this tremendous cultural uh, consciousness—I mean, it had been buried, you know, so so concertedly under uh under u.s imperialism where where did they come into contact with all of uh this consciousness around um puerto rican culture and and what what are some of the sources that were informing them that you know about i mean i'm sure there's some that you you weren't aware of um uh since you were a child but things that you know about or individuals well at that time i was learning about don pedro albiso campos which even in the late 60s was considered a radical. And most people did not even want to talk about him. Sure. But his name popped up quite a bit in the circles around Titi and Aunt Lily, but especially Titi. And we find out, here's this gentleman, Puerto Rican of Africa, clearly of African ancestry, Harvard graduate, veteran, World War I veteran, multilingual, like a Renaissance man. And after going through the horrible racism of the American military in World War I, that highly radicalized him. And being a internationalist, because on uh, the Harvard campus, he related to everybody. And ironically, uh, with, with uh, very progressive Irish students who resonated with the uh, with the Irish Republican Army, if I'm not mistaken, and the that whole process of wanting to uh, decolonize from Britain. He's a Renaissance man. Why was he demonized so much, mm. like Malcolm X? I said, "Whoa! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute!" 
this little island we come we come from is not just this tourist trap. And then you find out about the sterilization of our women in the 40s, receiving American citizenship in 1917, really to bolster the uh, military. But now you could draft these Puerto Rican men and send them to World War I to segregated troops where, where Puerto Ricans clearly of, of color, African uh, phenotype, were um, segregated. And as the story was told to me, they were told, Don Godro was told not to fraternize with the African Americans, mm -hmm. divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning all of this. So it is this archetype, archetypical persona in Don Albizu Pedro, Pedro Albizu Campos, informing Titi's. Um, passion and energy and then that fueled education this was this is a man who graduated from harvard with letters degrees wait a minute why don't we how come he's not a household word harvard that's not bronx community college harvard from puerto rico spanish dumb okay and then of course um as quiet as it was kept, Malcolm X. Now, uh, even if Malcolm X was not the household word, you mentioned his word, his name, and the people like looked around like nobody's listening. But I read his biography. So, wow, autobiography. What? This is a Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. See? And then, of course, I saw Titi get along with Mayor John Lindsay and politicians of the day. She didn't come off as a, uh, a foaming at the mouth leftist radical. No. She was like uh, another personality of the day was Bella Abza. Sure. So these matriarchal, warm, tough as nail mama types who had a diplomacy and a warmth, you know, like, oh, let's have down, have a, let's have a cup of coffee. There's a talk. Almost like a, um, a mafioso godfather. Hey, how you doing? Hey, <laughs> sit down. How you doing? How's the family? You want a cup of coffee? You want a, you want a cannoli? You look a little tired. <laughs> Titi had this way of disarming people. She could walk, call John Lindsay on the phone, the mayor. So she had this charisma, socio-political skills, social skills are like uncanny. And talk to like the police department with these redneck police, white shirts, the COs, commanding officers, and disarm these guys. Tough Irish. Who didn't want anything to do with ghetto life, although they came Pride to generations, you know, Hell's Kitchen, growing up tough, but they're now part of the middle class and they kind of lost their empathy with the other groups who are going through the same crap. Yeah. Hard as nails, guys. Deity could disarm them. Hey, Officer, Officer O'Neill, how you doing? Want some coffee? I got some nice coffee with hot milk and Nice sugar and some pastries. You want, to, you want some? Sit down. Let's talk. And she disarmed these guys. So she is well informed by almost revolutionary personas. But yet she had the swag, maternal, matriarchal New York swag to commiserate with the politicians of the day who carried big sticks and had influence in white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite society, New York elite society. She could, she could commiserate on those levels. Mm. So her, her also her other influences were politicians and social leaders who had those same skills like Dalla Abzug, like Shirley Chisholm. Sure. 
probably a handful of other women who could defend themselves uh, uh, linguistically with intelligence and a real keen sense of human relations. This was a Titi I, I edified to this day. That's the style I like. See, we got to get along. You got to, we have to get along politically here. And we may have different perspectives. It's not to, for debate or argument. It's perspectives along the political scale, the political spectrum. But we could talk about it. Let's have a conversation. This is nothing new. Look what our Ashkenazi Jewish brethren went through. Look what the Italian Americans went through. They, Sacco and Vanzetti were not. Uh, these were serious personas in the Italian American community, and of course, being trained by Vito Marcantonio and La Guardia. These are visionary Italian American men who didn't forget their roots, the salt of the earth. Titi kind of in, uh, uh, personified all of that. So she was informed by leaders that some of us didn't know of in terms of household names, but then she was informed by leaders that wound up on the TV news, like Bella Azad, Abzug, Shirley Chisholm, and even the mayor, John Lindsay, I think she had the same level of rapport with Abe Beam, even with Ed Koch later on. Mm. She could talk to them, call him up on his private line. Listen, Ed, I got to talk to you. You got a couple of minutes? There's some issues we got to have a conversation of. By the way, how you doing? How's the village? How's things in Greenwich Village? <clears throat> she knew how to disarm people. So I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Did it did. Um, pa Pastor, you want to um, ask ask any other other questions? No. Uh, yeah. I just uh, you know just a comment. Uh, you know, uh, Baba Tony, you're you're an extremely inspirational speaker. Uh, you know, Thanks. Thank you. Know, my, Thank obviously, you. my research skills are you know lacking. If you know, I hadn't uh, come upon you before and. Uh, uh, thank you for this. It's enlightening. Hopefully, we'll get a lot more people of color, students of color, color researchers that will access our archives and, yeah. and hear, yeah. not just hear, but with people like you feel what the, you know, we went through. You know, thank you. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. And you know, uh, I need to share this. Those of us who've acquired uh, some mileage chronologically, <laughs> And a lot of experiences. Uh, our cup flows over. We got to tell our stories. And I'll take the opportunity to promote my, my wife, Carmen Maria Alutisa Rivera, Mondesir. She's got tremendous stories herself that I hear over and over and over. And people got to know of her history too. So a lot of us, and this is part of the process of, uh, I'm not going to say getting old, of maturing. When these gray hairs start to pop out, we want to share. We want to share the stories, the acquired wisdom. A lot of this wisdom that we acquire is through hard knocks and through real life experiences. Some of them were painful. Some of them were very uh, character building. So I want to thank Dr. Stephen Payne with this organization, this institution that has um, structures to archive this data. And to yourself, Pastor Crespo, yeah, as an archivist, you remind me of what Aunt Lily, Lillian Lopez Cruz, my Aunt Lily, what she did to bring historical uh, appreciation through literacy and through audio visuals to children whose self-esteem was very low because the institutionalized education system of this culture, I have to say it, is lacking. Mm -hmm. in, a, in 50 years, gentlemen, I've seen our populations dumbed down. Dumbed down. 
And it's not the young people's fault. It's across the board. Titi fought for bilingual education. What's so, what's so radical about uh, speaking two languages in a culture that's anglophonic? I call it anglophonic chauvinism. Mm -hmm. My wife come for um, a, a self-imposed sabbatical, traveled throughout Europe in the uh, mid-70s on Ural trains. And she told me she was amazed at the young people getting on those trains. And as the train would go to, uh, from Italy into Switzerland, into Spain, into Germany, these young people just toggled and spoke the language of where the train was passing through and were completely conversant. And she came back like, wait a minute, five languages? These are young, pe young people and they travel by themselves. This was not like riding the number five train from Brooklyn to the Bronx. These are traveling from country to country to country. And getting off the train with a knapsack and, and, and traversing the streets of the big cities, eating the food, speaking the language, and just coming back with all this life experience. Why is that so complicated? See? So what we have in the United States now Oh my goodness, where critical thinking is not taught in school? Diti and Lily epitomized, personified critical thinking. And that was embellished by her two lovely colleagues, women who I adore, Ellen Lurie and Kathy Gold. Gold. Why? In Jewish culture, I learned this late years later. And it's the rabbinical studies say, you know, we have license to question God. We don't just say yes, yes, yes. You know, say, listen, God, uh, can we ask you some questions here? <laughs> um, why? Who? Where? It's in their theology. It's in their philosophy. It works into the culture. It's okay to ask questions. If we're diplomatic about it, we show respect. We need to ask questions. We're not trained in this culture to ask questions. See? So I hope that's answering your question. I kind of forgot what the original question is. I went off into my, uh, my process here, but I hope it answers some questions you have. Ab absolutely. Um, I Pastor, I, ha I have a final question for, for Baba Tony, um, but before I ask that, do you have anything else you'd like to ask Baba Tony? No, not at this moment. Okay, um, so so Baba Tony, this is a question that you could probably easily speak four yeah. or five hours on, um, but, uh, uh, but but we'll, we'll, we'll ask it anyway. Uh, what does the Bronx <laughs> represent to you? Wonderful question. I've been reflecting on this in a nutshell. History of place. Matter of fact, I wrote it down. History of place. History of place. Let's, let's focus on that for a minute. This is amazing. This place we call the Bronx is named after Jonas Bronx, who had a big farm in a geographic area which was part of lower Westchester County. How many years has the Bronx been called the Bronx? Maybe 100, 200 years? Maybe. 120 200, tops, maybe? 120, 150 years. Let's think about this in the scheme of things. That's a drop in the bucket of human history, history of place. Who were the indigenous family living here in little villages, little communities before Jonas Bronk? So that leads me to the second point. And it's, it's, it's more philosophical, and theological, and big picture. I see urban America in New York City, for example, as a petri dish 
It's a petri dish. It's an experiment. We are a human experiment. In the scheme of history, to take area that was farmland and turn it into an urban, I'm not going to say oasis, an urban jungle where in the second half of the 20th century during the 70s, 60s and 70s morphed into a ghetto from a working class area designed for working class children of immigrants from Europe. How, how does it turn into a ghetto in 15 and 20 years and then burns down? Is that a human experiment or what? It's a Petri dish. So this is where I have to become spiritual and step back. What does the Almighty want us to do down here? He's forming he, she, he, she, the cosmic all. This is a Petri dish to form our character, our soul's journey, and this a concrete maze of a society that morphs every 10 to 20 years. So the South Bronx, I remember, from the 60s and 70s is completely transformed now. And Dr. Payne and Bastor, the other day we passed through, passing Port Morris, the South Bronx, I see more high rises, glass concrete buildings, what happened here? Oh, 200 years ago, this was farmland. Maybe 300 years ago, you could drink water from the Bronx River. Yeah. So how do I see the Bronx? It's a fascinating geographic, geodemographic petri dish of urban America in the 20th and 21st century. We need to study it. Because every ethnic group that exists on Mother Earth finds a home not only in this borough, but other boroughs like Queens. Where do you have that on Mother Earth's surface? Not many places. So I think it's a big cosmic experiment. It has to be studied. Because, for example, even in Co-op City, even in Co-op City, a, uh, an urban utopia was planned to be like an urban utopia on swampland, which that's a real interesting research project. <laughs> the, de demographic, the demographics have shifted so interestingly in 50 years. That's an area of research and study. It's like a laboratory, see? So what do I think about the Bronx? It's fascinating. It's heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, but also it's a, it, it's a promising story of the human experience when we study it and appreciate everybody's story, right? Appreciate everybody's story and the struggles they went through the uh, humanity they had to fight for to retain. And like, where, where do we go from here? Because look at current events of uh, September 2022. As my uh, Ashkenazi Jewish uh, relatives would say, I vey. Or I Dios mio. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And we have that in microcosm in the Bronx. We're praying that we're, we're not going to go through what Pakistan and Puerto Rico and Jackson, Mississippi is going through, but climate change is real. Yeah. Can we grow our, can we grow our own food and, and, and new, newly uh, created farms? How about potable water? How about cooperative economics? Instead of the capitalist model, even the mom and pop store can't survive anymore on White Plains Road or Southern Boulevard. Yeah. But you have a, a core group of very collective-minded 
folks like the Mexicanos, who said, no, we're going to team up and open my own up our little stores here. But that's a collective mindset where the American individualism is something that some of our generation have uh, 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 appropriated as their own. So that's the Bronx to me, history of place, Petri dish, human experiment. And if we do things right, we can create a better society. That's what Titi would want to, would, would have wanted, Aunt Lily. And as Don Eugenio Maria de Ostos quote, hay que educar el pueblo. We have to educate the community. If I'm not mistaken, the etymology of educar from Latin educare means to liberate to liberate through knowledge and wisdom and understanding, comprehension. That's what I live for. And we all love to learn, man. See? So let's let's let let's make this a universal. Quite frankly, let's make the Bronx Historical Society a go-to where studying and learning about history is not boring. Give it some life. It's these stories of human beings is fascinating. Indigenous communities here way before the Dutch, how did they live? They drank water from the Bronx River. They had their own languages. They, they not only survived, they thrived. And all these ethnic groups that came and went, Gazat moved out the city, moved out. They moved from the Bronx to suburbs to amalgamate into the larger North America, leaving the Bronx behind. Yeah. Why? Why did they leave Bronx behind? Why? I have good memories of the Bronx. So the Bronx Historical Society is providing a great service to everybody. So I'm not just kissing up to you, gentlemen. This is real. <laughs> I like to keep it real like Titi would do and say education is important. Studying history is important. And enjoy it. It should be fun, exciting, inspirational. There you go, gentlemen. Absolutely. There you go. Stand up and applause every time you conclude that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm honored, man. I, I really am. I'm honored. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Payne, did you want to conclude? Uh, say any closing words? Uh, sure, yeah. Just, just want to thank you again, Baba Tony, for sharing everything that you shared in the first part of your oral history and now in this part as well, um, and looking forward to uh, getting this out there and making sure people hear your story and, and all of these stories. Um, um, so thank you again, Baba Tony. And thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the recording now. Thank you again.